Next up, breaking into some more serious business. So this is uh, Alex Maschioli's channel. It's one of my five that I actually recommend that I watch all the time. Alex is great because he's got uh, you know people who are like smart money uh, leaders in the industry. So I like to see what is going on. Surprisingly, he has such low subscribers. I don't understand it. It's the same thing with like uh, Unchained with uh, Laura. She's got very few subscribers. I mean, but she has a podcast and it's awesome. But on YouTube, not that many. But she has like the best guests of all time. So um, if you want to check this out, I definitely highly recommend him. And you can find all my recommendations in the description. I'm not one of those people that just tries to like hoard all, all the views and all the subscribers. There's way too much information out there. So don't just take, you know, my word for it. There's a lot of different opinions and you shouldn't be in an echo chamber. So get out there and find a bunch of people. So he's just one, one of the guys that I listen to. So uh, this is Alex. Uh, then he's got his co-host, uh, Ryan, uh, the much smarter and probably the best haircut in cryptocurrency, I must admit. And then on this one, he's got uh, Liz Kuka. I hope I said her right name right. And she is the executive director uh, for Ethereum Classic Lab. So he had her on and it was it was a good lesson, uh, you know, like to, to not like badger somebody. Very nice. Uh, but then he got to this question, uh, which was 1736 in, which she, which was the question I think everybody was at was was probably trying to answer, which is what the heck's going on with this 51 percent attack? And listen to what she says. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we'd be remiss not to ask is um, is about what's happened recently over the last couple of weeks. Um, there's been some 51 percent attacks on the ETC, um, and you know, I and you look at it and it, you see there might be different motivations for it. Um, there hasn't been any instance. I think five million. With, with nothing that's super out of the ordinary. Like no one walked away with three hundred million dollars. Um, can you give us a little hint into that? Because to have a fifty-one percent uh, attack on on a well-known coin uh, such as yourselves, it, it you know it brings it to the forefront a little. It does. And in order to do that 51% attack from uh, earlier in the month, the one that kind of netted out 5 million or so, the attacker, so they had to purchase some hash power, right? They spent a couple hundred thousand dollars on that, but they did a double spend. So they also put up $5 million of their own money onto the exchanges where they did the double spend. So we know it's someone who had capital. <laughs> it wasn't just some, like you have to have the capital to really pull it off as well when it comes to double spend. So that, that's certainly unfortunate. Um, one other challenge that happens when you have attacks like this uh, is you can't control an exchange. Like I can't tell any of the great exchanges that we work with like what to do or what their policy, policies should look like. And so these attacks always happen to hot wallets instead of the cold wallet. So the cold wallet's safe and secure. It's the custody, the custody solution. Well, the hot wallet's what gets targeted and tampered with. Um, and so some exchanges allow for much larger holdings in the hot wallet. And that's how the five million was was stolen essentially is because an exchange had a had a hot wallet that allowed for a much greater holding. Uh, secondly, most exchanges or most kind of premier um, well-known exchanges, when you do a large transaction, say like 100 Bitcoin, you're going to have to do a video call to prove you are whom you say you are, have it on record, so on and so forth. And um, that's also something that we've, we've seen some exchanges that get hacked or get attacked don't have in place. And so a lot of these hackers or like theft, these thefts um, are happening also at, at an exchange because they know the exchange's vulnerabilities in place. So yes, it's through ETC, but it's also through the exchange. Um, thankfully, no consumers or retail investors were impacted. It's just the exchanges um, who had a loss and had to utilize their insurance, unfortunately, to, <laughs> to deal with it. And if you take a look at Ryan's face right now, he is blown away by that explanation. So I'm not going to say much about this. I'm just going to put it all out there and see what you think. Now, I'm going to link this video in the description, and I highly encourage you to watch the whole thing. It's pretty interesting about what goes on in the background and the stories that are told. Uh, however, I, I will just say this for anybody who is taking a look from the outside in. When I look at people who were involved in very high level positions for a business, um, there are two types that, that I've seen. And Liz kind of does this here. She 
kind of takes ownership of it, but then she kind of slides off and says, well, this, you know, also the exchanges. Great. I'll always remember Elon Musk uh, during one of um, his launches for SpaceX. And he came out and, and the the reporters, uh, it actually had was just about to go off. And, and they, they asked him, they said, Elon, what do you think about what, what's going to happen here? He said, well, there's two things. He goes, uh, if this if this is successful today, which he goes, I think it is, he goes, I have nothing but praise and high regard to my team around me because they are responsible for this. Uh, they did a great job. However, he says, the second thing is, is if it doesn't work and there's a collapse, and there's something wrong with the launch, then it's all on me because it is eventually all comes down to the one person in charge. And that is me. And uh, I will go back to the drawing board and fix it. So it's always an example. And it's the same thing like as far as business, as far as life, even when I was in the military, it's the same type of thing. Take ownership of it, say what it is, say how you're going to fix it, and off you go. So again, Liz kind of did it there a little bit, but a little bit of a shirking of responsibility in my opinion, and that's just my opinion. So let me know what you think in the comments section. I did ask that question in a poll, and here's what we got. I said, this is just three hours ago, I said after watching the video, with Classic Labs director Liz Kuka and her explanation, uh, would you invest in Ethereum Classic? And I gave the actual time uh, stamp at 1740. And uh, out of the almost 500 votes, uh, the vast majority is nope, I would not invest into it. And I got to tell you right now, me, I'm the same way. And I understand the explanation that was given, but it's all about confidence. It's all about trust. Trust is a currency that you cannot buy. So when you have these types of issues, you got to come out strong. You got to come out and be like, you know what? This is what happened. This is what we're going to do. This is the, the opportunity that we have. We'll not mess this up and da 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 da. I mean, I can even remember back back in the day, and this is this is for like, this is an old story. Old story for, for older people. So this is back in the early 80s when Johnson & Johnson, who makes Tylenol, uh, somebody had gone into stores and they had taken bottles of Tylenol and they had laced it with cyanide, some some nutcase, and uh, people died. Uh, seven, there was like eight deaths, ten, I can't remember how many deaths there were. So this, as a company, you know, as soon as this happened, Tylenol's shares and the uh, actual stock or product went through the, just fell through the, through, the, through the ground. No one wanted to buy Tylenol because it could be potentially laced with cyanide. And this is one of those things that was like a big deal. So what did they do? So the CEO of Tylenol came out and he said, look, this is an issue and this is a huge problem. We understand it's all about trust. And here's exactly what we're gonna do. We are going to make tamper-proof resistant bottles. We're going to put a cover on top of that. Inside those bottles, each and every one, will be a big piece of cotton like we are now all used to. So if you see any of these, these tampered type of products, do not buy it and we will look into this, this, uh, this issue that has come about and we will make sure that we correct it and it all falls on us. And guess what happened? Tylenol still around. Within, I think, six months it was, they had regained their entire market share of everything they had just lost. And this is after people had died. So, I mean, that's a very extreme case, but you get where I'm going with this one. Um, me personally, I'm not going to buy Ethereum Classic. I mean, I never really got into it at all anyhow. But uh, there was one thing that, uh, that she did say, which is pretty interesting. Liz did say, you know what? With all these different uh, fees as far as Ethereum goes, Ethereum Classic's looking pretty good. And uh, on that one, you know, she was right because the uh, Ethereum fees right now are through the roof, even with what's going on with DeFi. So let me know what you think about that in the comments section. That'll be an interesting converse, uh, conversation between everybody. And uh, let's move on to our last story.